We're going to go back to the book of Nehemiah in chapter 2 this morning and visit one more time. The book of Nehemiah. My message this morning will be almost two-ply. We'll talk about uh, our wall a little bit, and we'll talk about his wall. But we first of all begin with the reading in chapter 2 of the book of Nehemiah. And verse number 18. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which is upon, which was good upon me, as also the king's word that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Samballot the Horonite, and Tobiah the servant, the Amorite, and Jeshim the Arabian, heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us, and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Then answered I them, and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will rise up and we will build. But you guys, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Israel. It's a very interesting story. It's a wonderful story. A man with a burden to do God's will. A man that had the hand of God all over him and all upon him. And then there was a people, my friend, that were willing to love. Love to the place, my friend, of self-sacrifice and of giving their own lives. It's interesting, this assignment, this great assignment that God gave him, my friend, was recorded on the page of eternal history. And you know, I think often we need to remind ourselves that you and I are on a page of eternal history. It is not just a day in March. It's just not the 18th day of March. It's uh, in 2017, the year of our Lord. It's much, so much more than that. It's a day when the spiritual history and the decisions that you make and the decisions that I make, the words that I speak, my friend, are recorded forever and we have an impacting difference. And what they did, my friend, affected the glory of God and it affected, my friend, the souls of men. And no different they than us. What we do, we affect without question, my friend, God's glory. And we affect without question the souls of men this morning. Amen. And we are on the eternal page. Yes, my name is Daniel Richard Lamb. That's who I am. But there's so much more. There's so much more than a gym light that invites and brings and brought and see a man get saved. There's so much more to it than just the physical, the earthly, the tangible. And so many times people, uh, they miss, they can only see the moment. They can't see beyond that moment, that time. You know, I, I think that these people, some of them realized that they were really on this page of eternal history. And it's so important. You know, there's, there's so much more than the wall in this story. Um, there's so much more in the wall. Uh, the wall had been down for years. The people had survived for years. The wall had been down for not 10 years and not 20, but scores of years. And now the heart, the burden of a man got right. The hand of God was upon him. The people's hearts were moved. And my friend, they did what they should do. And it's so very important. And can I say that our wall, as a church, we've always had walls, the storefront building, the Grange building, and we've always had walls. The first buying of this property here where we are on now, the first building, uh, and then we moved, of course, to the gymnasium, and now this building, and we've been in, in a time when we've not built or did anything in remodeling for the longest period of the history of this church. That's very interesting. And so we've been in this church 17 years now, and we're fixing to refresh it and make it uh, make it fresh. And so our remodel is not for this year and for next year, but it's for the next, the next maybe 17 years before we do something different or uh, change things around. But as you un understand and realize that God's assignments are always on purpose. The assignment of the wall that God gave to Nehemiah and those people, those some, some 43,000 that were there assembled in that city, um, that that assignment that God gave them was so much more. It began something in their lives, in the lives of those people, my friend, that could only happen because of the wall. And God doesn't give us assignments because he wants to see us busy or he wants to see us love or sacrifice. That's not necessary, Lord, because God has different and deeper works in your life and mine. How many would think for a minute and agree with me and say, you know what, Pastor, I believe that God is working in my life. Amen. You know what, can I tell you this, that I believe that God is at work in our lives. And if you read about this story and you read these 13 chapters, you find that Nehemiah, there's not much talk about, about the past or where they've been or what happened or how it all happened. But what happened, my friend, it was talking about where they were and what they were doing with the God 
of heaven and the Holy Spirit of God and the work of God for them. And can I say that you and I must realize that? You know, in the days that we live, sometimes we think of the church as different than God really thinks of it. Sometimes we, we think of the church as being a place of entertainment. We think of ourselves as being the audience. Okay, Pastor Matt, you and the choir, I lose you, Brother Matt. How many so tall can I lose a guy in a crowd like this? Amen. There he is. He steps in from nowhere. Amen. Now, now they look, you look to us, you listen to the choir, you listen to Brother Wilkin as he sings, you listen to... Brother Jim, as he gives a testimony, listen as Brother Valier quietly in just a few seconds says a few things, but has affected so many of our lives in the, in the background and, and what he's done and the advice that he's given. And, and if we're not careful, we'll, we'll have to think that, the thought that, my friend, that we ourselves are the audience. So go after it and get it done. We watch them like sometimes we watch actors on stage. Um, and if they do good, then we applaud them or we cheer them or we might even say amen because we're in God's house. Kierkegaard, quite a different name, isn't it? He said in the generation that we live that churches are in entertainment sanctuaries. If a pastor tells good stories and good jokes and they inspire me, make me feel good about myself, that I'm happy and I like it there. You know, um, we listen to the music and we want it to be of a professional caliber. But again, it's not only of a professional caliber, but it's got to be of, a, of my particular taste. We, we've adapted, my friend, the world philosophy in our churches. And the Hillsborough Bible Baptist Church must be different because of this, because of this book that we have. And no matter how the world dictates us and forms our lives and makes us, we got to be a people, my friend, that bring ourselves back to truth and right and realize that, my friend, you are not the audience. You and I are not the audience as we listen to someone speak or sing or do whatever they do for the Lord. You know, uh, a service ought not be, and I have sometimes, I have a lot of, I have a lot of fun things happen in, in ministry. And after 40 years, you know, you can enjoy so much. But I can remember when Shiggy was sitting in the auditorium and I winked at her and it took me a long time to realize that there's six or seven ladies between me and her. And I, I had to clean up my act just a little bit. But every once in a while I get, give guys a thumbs up or they'll give me in the midst of a message, I'll get a thumbs up in the message. This church has been a very sweet church to pastor and be a part of. But so many times, you know, if we're not careful, we'll give our thumb, thumbs up or our thumbs down about a message or about a song or a singing or a choir or this or that. The story is told about a dad on his way home at church with his car filled with all of his family. And dad got fussing about the sermon that it was too long. Mom got talking about the instruments that they were playing too loud. The sister that was going to college for music, determined that the one that sung the, uh, the special that morning was off half key. The grandma said, you know, she couldn't hear well, but of course they sat way in the back of the church anyhow. So. And little Johnny had to chime, after, chime in after hearing all this fussing and said, yeah, and dad, that lady that sat on me had, had a big head of hair and I couldn't see beyond her. They went down the road just a little bit farther and little Johnny said, dad, but you know what? You got to admit it. You just got to admit it, dad. Um, for a buck, that program was really good, amen. When you only gave a buck, Dad, it was really pretty good, amen. In the church, my friend, we are not the audience. We're not here to be entertained. Our audience is God, is God himself. As a messenger for him, I deliver his message. But no matter what you do with it, it's not about you. It's about me being obedient to God's will and doing what I need to do and saying what I need to say. You understand, in the church, my friend, we are not the audience. We are not that one to be entertained. You know, the mindset, and you know, we as desperate people all being broken. Is there anybody here not broken? No, we're all broken, amen? You're broken different than I am, or maybe some of us are broken the same way, but we're just a bunch of broken sinners. That's who we are. Don't think of yourself any better than anybody else. You might be broken a different way or a different place, but you're broken. But our mindset needs to be right. It needs to be not, now watch this now, listen, stay with me, and we're going to get to this message. The mindset is not what did I get out of the church. But now listen to this. What did God get out of the church this morning? 
What did he get out of this service? Was he pleased with the way I sang, with the way I gave? I was preaching on the second night of this meeting, and I haven't had this happen for a long time. I had it happen one time when I was a kid preacher in Missouri. One time, only one time. Well, literally, the service was so disrupted because of the movement of God that I just stopped everything and watched and listened. The man came forward in the service. I just turned to my conclusion and just started down to make the conclusion. The man came forward and knelt at the very front as close as he could to the altar and began to cry out to God. And then it erupted in such a way that we all knew that God had visited those people. And so I stopped. And I just let God do his work. There was nothing else that needed to be said. There wasn't an instrument that needed to be played. There wasn't a song that needed to be sung. We just needed to meet with God. And the question is, my friend, not my friend, how did they sing? The question is, how did you sing and how did God enjoy your singing? The man left the service, it's been several years ago. He left our service, and after, after the service was over, he came to me, Pastor, did you see me leave the service? I said, I sure did. And I said, so did everybody else see you leave the service. And then he began to break down, and he said, Pastor, I just want you to know that God spoke to me about my dishonesty with my heart in giving to God, and I had to give to God what God spoke to me about. And he didn't want to wait. He did not miss. Now, I kind of like that, don't you? I'm trying to tell you that we become so programmed that we program God out of our services and God out of our churches. And when our mindset's completely wrong, Phil Yancey says that the, that the church exists probably not to provide entertainment or build self-esteem or facilitate friendships, but is, the purpose is to worship God. Can you say amen? amen. That's what it's about. Walter Kirk said, to worship is to remember who owns the house. Who owns the house? You see, the thing that pleases God most in a service is the changed hearts. And the con commitment, my friend, of committing themselves to doing what God wants them to change. A.W. Torres, our churches these days are filled, he says, with soft breed of Christians that must be fed constantly with harmless fun to keep them interested to stay in the house of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You know, we get it so, we're so backwards, we're so wrong in our mind and our mindset. You know, our generation likes to be challenged, but they don't like to be changed. <laughs> you're, you're still with me? Can you say Amen? Hey, Amen. Amen. Just, just help me along a little bit. Because I got the plow set pretty deep and the tractor's lugging down a little bit. And, I'm going to turn some soil over here a little bit. You can hang on with that. Amen. Amen. I love to preach. If there's anything I told Brother Matt, I told Brother Matt here a year or so ago, I have never loved the preaching and the teaching and the study of God's Word as I have in these last years. And I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed that, to feed people. And you know, I think you deserve to be fed when you come to the house of God. I think it ought not be just flimsy, flamsy. I think this man needs to spend time alone with God and get the message from God and give it to you. And without it, you can't be the husband, you can't be the wife, you can't be the family, we can't be the children, we can't be the church we need to be. And I think that's a responsibility of a man of God. However, my message, my point be this. My point is simply this. Is that we're a generation that we want people to feed us, but we don't want to go to the kitchen to cook for someone else that they might be fed. That's what I'm saying. You know, I was in the hospital there with Suge, and uh, I was walking down the halls. The first day I slipped in with a pair of jeans and an old ragged shirt, and I just honestly wanted to hide. And I determined that's what I was going to do with Suge this time. And I've never been to her hospital with her like that. I was just going to slide in that room and I was going to hide and be with her. And, and then the girls came and they come to me and said, Hey, Dad, uh, there's a lady and her husband. Dad, you got it. And Dad, you got to, you got to meet him and you got to, got to go see him, Dad. And so the next day, my, my clothes was different. And the next day, I was walking down the hall and I heard a voice coming out of one of the rooms that says, is that you, Pastor Lamb? Would you come and pray with my daddy? 
Would you come and pray for my dad? And what I'm trying to tell you is that, my friend, that we are a people, my friend, that need to be involved in the work of God. And we need to allow the work of God to happen in our lives. You know, we must not be a people of performance, but a people of worship. Amen. What the, we want the Holy Spirit to come, but he's got to get here and get here fast because at 12 o'clock, Pastor, if you don't cut this thing short, I'm leaving the service. I'm going to pack my dudes. I'm going to put my coat on. I'm walking out that door. And I don't care what the Holy Spirit of God's doing. And all God's people said, Do you think that we once again need to go back to God's book and figure out what God's got to say? I've got three points in my message. Um, they'll be good points and you'll enjoy them. I mean, they're just, they're just fun. I mean, they're just fun thoughts and truths, wonderful truths to feed your heart and mind. Um, and put our, most of what happened in the story of Nehemiah happened, my friend, because of what happened in the people's hearts when they started building the wall. It began, this is my conclusion, but that's not the end of my message. I'm just giving you my two points at the tail. It began with somebody in some place. And it can begin with you and begin with here. Now let me give you my message. Can I give you my message? Are you ready? First of all, it was much more than the wall. All the assignments of God make a test upon our love for him. And he brings these stewardship assignments into our lives, my friend, that we might take question about our own heart. I can remember sitting around a table with three different chairs. We had four chairs at our table, and three of the four were all different. And because that's all we had. You know, when you're new married and you start out those things, it didn't make a difference if they matched the decor, if they're all the same color. You just wanted something to sit on, Amen. You say, what kind of couch did you have when you first got married? We had the color of couch that they left behind in the house that they left when they left. That's the color. Now, now you know, we get, we get different. What I know about it is simply this. As I know about life, just because you have more, it doesn't mean you have less, less heart problems. You have the same problem. Then we gave out of nothing. Now we get out, give out of something. Does that make sense to you? You know, it was much more than a wall. It was Adam and Eve when God tested their obedience. And the building of the temple or the tabernacle of the art, it all called upon that people to make a test of their own heart. You know, our first steps were all, hit, were, were all of faith because we had nothing. You see that picture in the bulletin? I don't know if you can recognize some of those guys. They look so much different. Look at Eddie Bayless in there. Take a look at him. Amen. What a different look. I mean, he's grown up to be a big man. Amen. And yeah, that big old mustache. Um, Think with me now and realize it was much more than a wall. And I tell you, can I say there's much more than a refreshing or remodeling of the Lord's house. And you need to be involved. I know, I know some of you won't be able to work. Just come up and <laughs> encourage us and cheer us on. Tell us where to put something or tell us how to take it down. We won't pay any attention, but do it. Just come and do it. Just be around us. Amen. Amen. Number two, number two, there will always be challenges to overcome. Go back with us to chapter 2 now in verse 19. But when Sam, Balat, the Hornite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Amorite, and Jeshim, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? There will always be challenges to overcome. There will always be words to overcome. You know, these people, my friend, that were the Sam, Balat, Tobiah, the Jeshims, they couldn't see what damage they would cause with their words. Now listen. Everybody got their ears on? Amen. Amen. They had no idea the damage they called with the words they say. Some of the best things that we could ever do as Christian people is to shut our mouth. Amen. Nobody's left yet. Thank you so much for that. If you go to our house, there's a couple places where we have just one now with just us sugar and I. We have one dirty laundry place. I guarantee if you open that door, it probably has a different smell than you open a door of clean clothes. You know, when we have people come to our house, we don't take them and say, you just have got to see the stinking laundry mat we got. But you just got to see these socks, man. They're ab they can stand up by themselves. You can stand them in the corner and they stink. We don't do that because we're careful with our words. And all God's people said, let me be careful with my words. Amen. These people, the Sambalat, Tobiah, the Jeshim, the Arabian, they could choose the difference they would make, but the choice had to be theirs. They could choose it, but it was up to them. 
Because other people lost their focus, it didn't mean that these people of God would lose theirs. Get, now, get a hold of this. There's always going to be people that will lose their focus. And God's people said now, Amen. there are always going to be those people. But it was interesting, my friend, there's some that didn't. Chapter 6, chapter 6, chapter 6, verse 1. Now, it came to pass when Samballat and Tobiah and Jeshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates that Samballat and Jeshem sent unto me, saying, Come and let us meet together in some one of the village in the plain of Onan. But they brought, excuse me, but they thought to do me mischief. But I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Now understand that this, just because some people lose their focus, that doesn't mean that you've got to lose yours. Amen. People in love with the Savior, my friend, didn't lose their focus. Nehemiah said, I'm not fixing to come down because I'm doing a great work. I'm doing the work of God. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of work we do, but some work is great work. Shuggy's getting better. She said, honey, you know that tree we planted last year that you planted over there in front of the garage? I'd like that to be moved over there on the other side of the house. You know? There's a lot of good work you do just to stay married. Amen. You understand that? There's a lot of good work to do. But can I say there's a great work and we should lay down everything, my friend, that we have in our hand to do the work of God when God calls on us. You get a hold of that? There's a priority, my friend, and that be our relationship with God. All things we can't lay down, but some things we can. God's work is a great work. People lost their focus, but not all did. And the people, my friend, that were committed and loved to the Lord, my friend, you know, they didn't stop doing his work. Look in verse 15 of that chapter. So the wall was finished in the, in the 20th and 5th, uh, 5th day of the month, Elu, in 50 and 2 days. Amen. <laughs> Man, we finished that dude and we did it in 52 days. And can I say, there'll be challenges and obstacles to overcome. There'll be words. There'll be actions. But my friend, the people that are in love and stay focused, my friend, are, they don't change their focus because of that. They keep in focus. They keep going. Amen. You see, those who lost their focus would miss so very much. Let me say that again. Can I say, if, if you miss God's will and his work in your life today, and the building of our wall, the wall that God's put us in place to do, if you do that, my friend, you will miss Samballat, Tobiah, Jeshim, the Arabian, and the rest of our enemies, he said. He said, you know what? they're going to miss a whole big bunch. <laughs> We're going to get it done. God's going to be glorified. People are going to be saved, but they're going to miss it. They miss it. Don't miss your day. Don't miss the day to serve with your hand. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Amen. Then number three, I'm doing good. I got five minutes, six minutes. Amen. The wall was just the beginning of what else God was doing. The Bible said that after they built the wall, the Bible said they gathered themselves together. Um, it's a powerful statement. It's a powerful word. Chapter 8, verse 1. Just stop there for a moment. And all the people gathered themselves. Now, that's interesting. There was a burden. There was a drive of heart. There was a love that happened inside of them. Chapter 8, and verse 1. And all of the people gathered themselves together as what, church? As what? one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest, excuse me, Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. And before the men and the women and those that could understand, the children that could understand, they heard the word of God. Those that were in the nursery weren't there maybe, but for sure those that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose. And beside him, and it lists all of these guys that I can't pronounce their names. And verse number five, I'm playing there. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, 
and he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen and Amen. And when lifting up their hands, they bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, can I tell you, when the people gathered themselves together, the wall was the beginning of the revival that happened in Jerusalem. And when they submitted and surrendered, my friend, their hands to the service of God, God took them farther. They must be willing to go to the first step if they'll ever go to the next step. And I tell you that God calls upon us to go the first step. My conclusion, and I'll be done. Obedience had to begin somewhere. Somewhere. Obedience began with somewhere. And it began with somebody. I would say that somebody was Nehemiah. No doubt. No doubt. That's where it began. But then it spread to the hearts. And there was others that had that same love and desire and obedience to be and to do exactly God's will as Nehemiah had. And I believe that today. That's what it is. God has a people, my friend, that he'll re start our fires and our, and our life because he leads us to different places and different walls of our life to do as well. And you know what? God wants to do that with us. It began with, obedience began somewhere with someone. Have you ever, ever had a place when you began your obedience? Have you got a place when you ever said, dear God, I want to surrender to you to be obedient to whatever your will be in my life. Lord, I, I want to surrender to do it. And it begins, of course, with your soul. It begins with being saved. It begins with trusting Jesus as Savior. It's, it's not hard to understand. It's very simple. It's not hard to be saved. It's hard to surrender. Obedience begins with somebody and some place. And when a person comes and says, you know what? I have never given my heart to God. And Adam and Eve, my friend, had trouble surrendering and doing what God wanted. And so all of us have. And so we come back because of the cross and because of grace and his blood and we can be saved. Let that obedience begin with you and let this be the place to start.